All right, we're ready for Jeremiah chapters 30 to 33 in our study. And here is our outline that we are following, the general outline from Wearsby. <clears throat> three major sections, and tonight we finish the first of those three major sections. We have the uh, national section, the personal section, and then we have the international section. And in the national section, uh, we've looked at the condemnation of the nation, then the leaders, and then we've been considering the captivity, and we finished that in our study last time. And tonight we're going to look at the period of restoration, that is, the promise that they're coming back into the land. Uh, this is a very important section. All of the sections of the book of Jeremiah are important. Don't mean that it's more important than anything else. But if this section were left out of the book, if we just took 30 to 33 out of the book, then we're missing a fundamental point that the book of Jeremiah is all about. And that is that they are coming back into the land, that there is the grace of God, there is the mercy of God, there is the love of God, but this is highly messianic in this section. And I want us to see that as we go along, and you have that in your handout, you're looking for some of that information as we go along. So this period of restoration, we'll say uh, two or three things about that. One is that if, if one of the criticisms of the book of Jeremiah, and by criticisms I mean, and I put that in quotations, as, as we study through the book of Jeremiah, sometimes we, we get vibes that say, you know, the prophet Jeremiah, like many other prophets, is just a prophet of doom. And, and so we, week after week after week after week after week, it's, it's sin and, and punishment, and sin and punishment, and doom and destruction. And that's discouraging. And so if you think Jeremiah is only about doom and destruction, tonight you're going to say you're wrong about that. Because it is as much a book about promise and hope and future as it is doom and destruction. So it is an encouraging book. And we're going to see that in this book of consolations as uh, one writer calls this section. And if we are those that tire of sin and destruction mentioned in the book, well, it's another lesson on sin and another lesson on destruction, what we're going to see tonight is love and we're going to see mercy and we're going to see grace. And if that's appealing to us, and it should be, then we're going to see that in, in chapters 30 to 33 tonight. Uh, there's another lesson to be learned from this section, uh, and we're going to come to the Messianic section uh, points here in just a moment. But there's another lesson we learned from that. If God is one who condemns sin and then he punishes and he's severe about that, but at the same time, God holds out mercy and love and forgiveness and restoration, then we ought to be the same. Meaning by that, that when we deal with sin in the church or in our family, we ought to deal with it severely. We ought to be strong. We ought to take a strong, severe condemnation against sin, but at the same time hold out the hand of mercy and love and forgiveness and restoration. That's the kind of people we, we ought to be. So let's look at a summary of these chapters. <clears throat> and you're looking for this in your handout. Um, what is chapter 30 about? Well, chapter 30 is about the promise of Israel and Judah returning to the land. And so he talks about both the northern and the southern kingdom. The prophet Jeremiah is to the southern kingdom, obviously, but the northern kingdom is already gone. And this is very late, but tonight's lesson is dated. What is dated in the section is very late. We're talking about the time of Zedekiah. And so we're a year away from the fall of Jerusalem in, in two chapters tonight. So be, be that as it may, what, what we're seeing though is that there's the promise that Judah and Israel are going to be united again, come back together, and they're going to return to the land. That's the point of chapter 30. Now chapter 31 lists a whole parcel of blessings that will occur in the period of restoration. And so what are we talking about in the period of restoration? Well, that's going to include the return into the land, but it's also going to include the messianic period, our time uh, as well. Chapter 32 is most interesting and fascinating because Jeremiah is told to buy a field to show that he believes what he says, what he's preaching and what he's prophesying. We'll get to that. And then chapter 33 is highly messianic where it deals with the future with the branch. Now, <clears throat> I want to go to something that we have looked at many times in several of the chapters, several of the books, but not several of the chapters, but several of the books. And we've looked at it in Jeremiah already. But what... 
Uh, and, and the guy that taught me this principle, Brother Umphreys, John Umphreys, we, you have his workbook, you have access to it. He's got about a 600 page commentary on Jeremiah that is, it's outstanding. Uh, but he was the one that, as I said at his feet, that taught me this principle that what he calls prophetic blend. And I'll show you one of his slides in a moment. But he, I call it the prophet's view. If you could picture this, this person, just forget about prophecy for a moment. Let's say we go to the mountains. We're over here in the Smoky Mountains. And you see a mountain range and another mountain range. And it looks like those mountains just blend together. We can't see when one stops and the next one starts. But if someone could go around to 90 uh, degrees from us, what the way they may see is that what we're seeing is actually two different mountain ranges that are quite distinct. And there's some space between them. But from the vantage point of our looking, it looks like they all blend together. And so Brother Humphreys in his work on Jeremiah, this is taken from page 26 of his book. He calls it the prophetic blend. And so he has the prophet here looking at one mountain and then another mountain and from his vantage point it all blends together and he doesn't make a distinction in the two and yet we know that the return was quite distinct from the day of the Messiah so that's why for quite often in the prophets they'll talk about the return and you say well that has to have reference to them coming back into the land because it's in the context of them going away they're coming back and yes it does but then there's going to be blended right in without a distinction being made something that you're going to have to say that has to be messianic you say, how does it have to be a messianic? Because maybe it's quoted in the New Testament and applied to the Messiah. That's pretty good evidence to me. Uh, and then there's some other things that you say, I'm not sure that's messianic. But we're, if you're looking for messianic references, there are going to be many in the references tonight. We're going to make note of some of those, but, but there is this blending, what is called the prophetic blend. And so... For years, I've drawn this little diagram out in the margin of my text sometime where there is a prophecy about the return, but there's also in, in that a blending of the prophecy concerning the Messiah that there is this prophetic blend. And that little symbol reminds me this, this is a text where there's prophetic blend, as uh, Humphreys would describe that. Um, I think he's right about that. I think Humphreys uh, um, captured the thought uh, in, in that. So now let's go back to chapters 30 to 33. See if we can get through these chapters and make some sense of them. This is called, and I'm following Hark Rider's um, outline in his little workbook, and I, I like his, the way he outlined it generally. And he calls this section the Book of Consolation or the Period of Restoration. So this is their coming back into the land, again, blended in with the day of the Messiah. So here are the four chapters that we're going to look at. Israel and Judah are promised that they both are going to return to the land. So let's look at three things found in these chapters. We'll try to draw some highlights out of this and try to play to our, our handout as well. Um, now, chapter 30, beginning at verse 2, um, that the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, and he was told, and this is one of the things you're looking for, to write it in a book, write down the prophecy. And uh, because the days are coming, now notice verse 3. I want you to notice three things that we're looking for in verse 3. And that is, here are three things that uh, we learn from verse 3. That the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will bring back from captivity my people Israel and Judah. That's the northern and southern kingdom, says the Lord. And I will cause them to return to the land that I, will give their fa that I gave to their fathers and they shall possess it. So what are the three things I learned from that? Number one, captivity is coming to an end. It's going to be a while. It's going to be 70 years. They had him gone completely. Some are already in captivity. We're ready for the third invasion uh, shortly be, uh, beyond this. Uh, but nonetheless, they're going to come back from captivity. So the captivity is going to end. Secondly, Israel and Judah are going to be reunited. They were divided. They go into, Israel goes into Syrian captivity. Judah goes into Babylonian captivity. But then Assyria finally ultimately falls and is under Babylonian rule. And so they're going to be united. They're going to come, come back. And then thirdly, they're going to return to the land. Captivity could end, but they may not return to the land. They are going to return to the land. So those three things have just been told us in verse 3. Captivity is going to end. They're going to be reunited. And they're going to return to the land. Now, notice uh, beginning at verse 4, these are the words that he spoke. And notice how severe, uh, in the promise of how great the blessings are in the period of restoration, the, the writer and God, being the author, 
will, will tell us how severe the, the captivity was. And that's what he does right here in verses uh, 5 and 6. We heard the voice of trembling, uh, of fear and not of peace. And ask and see whether a man ever, uh, ever was ever in labor with a child. And why do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labor and, and face turning pale? In other words, the pains are like that being described as uh, a woman in labor. And th this is in great travail they have been in. He said, ask if you've ever seen anything like that. Uh, these men are going around and they're in great pain and distress. How severe it was. Uh, their faces are turning pale. But notice at the end of verse 7, but he shall be saved out of it. So here is the promise that's coming. Look at verse 8 now. God said, I will break his yoke from his neck and I'll burst his bonds. So I'm going to break the bonds of captivity. Now you might mark verse 9 as one of the messianic verses. You're looking for that in your handout. But they shall serve the Lord, their God, and David, their king, whom I will raise for, up for them. That has to be messianic. I, I can't do anything but make that a messianic reference. Uh, again, there's that prophetic blend. You say, well, I thought we were just talking about the captivity we return. Yes. Remember the mountains blending together? We, we, if we turn it around sideways, we're going to see the Messiah. We see the captivity, I mean the return. But looking at it from the vantage point of the prophet, it blends together as we've already noted. Now, notice in verse 10, 11, and on into verse 12, God is working out his plan. Now, this gets to the theme of what the, the whole book of the whole Bible is about. God is working out a plan. It's not just interesting stories, whether it be the story of the flood or be the uh, 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 Egyptian captivity or Babylonian captivity or whatever's going on. God's working out a plan. And here's the evidence of that. Now notice at the end of verse 10 that, uh, and your seed from the land of their captivity, Jacob shall return and have rest. God's going to bring the seed back. So what God doing? God's working out a plan. And uh, for I am with you, says the Lord. Now notice, though I have made a full end of the nations, verse 11, that I have scattered, I will not make a complete end of you, but I will correct you in, uh, I, I will correct you in justice. In other words, God's not going to make a complete end, but yet there's justice in bringing captivity upon them. But God said, I'm not going to make a complete end of you. What does that mean? God's not going to utterly destroy the nation. In other words, I send you off in captivity, but I'm not going to wipe you out. If I did that, then he's lost the nation through whom the seed's supposed to come, Genesis 12. So God's working out a plan, preserving his people, preserving his nation through whom the Messiah is coming. So the Messiah is seen, I think, in that preserving uh, and working out of his plan. Now let's begin at verse 12. I see the promise, the deliverance is to be written in a book. Beginning at verse 12, the Lord's going to heal their wounds while punishing their enemies. While God raises up, and raises up a nation to punish them, God is going to deal with that nation eventually. Uh, now notice beginning at verse 12, uh, the Lord says, your, your affliction is incurable, your wound is severe. There was no one to plead your cause. Mentions how that your lovers, verse 14, have forgotten you. You remember those lovers, meaning they went to other nations and went to their gods? They played harlotry with nations and with, with idols? Your lovers have forgotten about you, by the way. They, they're no help to you. Your wound is severe. They couldn't deliver you from your bondage over there. I'm going to deliver you, though, is what God is saying. Now, at verse 14, he said, I have wounded you with the wound of an enemy, with the chastisement of a cruel one, for the multitude of your iniquities because your sins have increased. In other words, this was justified in me sending you to captivity. It was quite severe. You brought it on yourself, by the way. Look at verse 15. Because of the multitude of your iniquities and because your sins have increased. You brought this on yourself. I feel sorry for it, but you brought it on yourself. Now notice at verse 17. Well, let's back up to verse 16. That those who plunder you shall be plundered. I'm going to take care of Babylon. Take, I've already took care of Assyria. I'm going to take care of Babylon. Here's what God's going to do for him, verse 17, to finish that section. He said, I will restore health to you and heal your wounds, says the Lord, because they called you the outcast, and this is Zion, and no one seeks her. In other words, they become kind of a, uh, a, uh, a taunt song of uh, saying concerning Israel, nobody cares about Israel anymore. God turned them over to, the, to Babylon and let Babylon do whatever and God's forgot about them. No, I hadn't forgot about them. I'm going to bring them back. They can say what they want to, but I'm going to bring them back. Now, verses 18 to 24, to finish this chapter, those in captivity are going to return and they're going to be established. So I'm hoping you're seeing so far, we're going to see more of the Messianic 
promises. But I hope you're seeing this, this coming back to the land, uh, God blessing them, God healing them, and God curing them, and at the same time, there is the promise of the Messiah. We're going to see that at verse 21 here in a moment. Now notice that verse 18, the city shall be built up on its own mound or its own ruins. In other words, Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And it was and burned. But then in the period, in the post-exile period, what did they do? They rebuilt the wall. Uh, they rebuilt the, the temple. They rebuilt out of its ruins. Uh, the same thing out of the ruins of this nation, out of this nation is going to come ultimately the Messiah, verse 21. Now, verse 19, uh, notice verse 20. Their children also shall be, uh, be as before, and the congregation shall be established before me, and I will punish all who oppress them. Now, interesting, verse 21, their nobles, New American Standard, New International said, leaders shall be from among them, and their governors shall come from their midst. That has to be messianic. Their governor is going to come from their midst, their ruler, their leader. So again, that seems to be messianic, and I think that's part, again, this blending of the prophet, prophecy. Do you think those who heard that fully understood, oh, that's the Messiah. I know that's talking about the day. Probably not. But later on, they can look back and say, oh, that is the Messiah. Because coming out of their midst, God's working out his plan. God's going to bring their governor, their leader, uh, a righteous leader, God's going to bring out from their midst. Uh, and you will be my people, verse 24, and, you'll, and, and uh, I will be their God. Um, now notice one more thing before we leave uh, this chapter. Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord, verse 23, shall go forth with fury, a continued whirlwind, and it will uh, fall violently on the head of the wicked. So God's wrath is poured out upon the wicked, whether it be his own people or whether it be Babylon, uh, whatever nation it may be. The fierce anger of the Lord, verse 24, will not return until he has done it and until he's performed the intents of his heart. Now that's interesting to me. That the Lord's fury goes forth until his purpose is accomplished. And so whether it be punishing Judah or Israel or whether it be Egypt or whether it be Babylon or it be the U.S. or whatever, God's fury goes forth until his will is accomplished. Uh, Revelation 4, he created a world that he could control to carry out his purpose. And that is a definition of providence. Um, God's providence uh, was at work and is at work as well. All right, that's chapter 30. Israel and Judah promised they're coming back. Write this down in a book, Jeremiah. They're coming back. I'll punish their enemy. I'm going to heal their wounds. The captivity is going to end. They're coming back, and they're going to be established. Coming out of that's the Messiah, and uh, several references to the Messiah. And I'm going to give you at least 12 of those references before we're through, if time permits. Let's go to chapter 31. Probably one of the most memorable quotations from Jeremiah 31 is one we just saw on uh, the Lord's Day in Hebrews 8. And that's down in verses 31 to 34. But we'll come to that a little bit later. Let's talk about the blessings that are going to incur, occur in this period of restoration. Now what, you say, the period of restoration, are we talking about the day of the Messiah? Or are you talking about the day of their coming back into the land? The answer is yes. <laughs> yes. There's this blending, again, of the concepts. Both are included. Uh, all through these chapters, all through 30 to 33, I'm convinced. Uh, you say, how do you know for sure? Well, I know verses 31 to 34 is talking about the Messiah because it's about the new covenant. And that's quoted in Hebrews 8, Hebrews 10, etc. Uh, I know verse 15 is quoted in Matthew 2 and applied to the day of the Messiah. So I know the Messiah is in this chapter, but I also know that this is in the context of them coming back out of captivity. So that's how I know both are, are blended together in this context. Now let's go through chapter uh, 31. The Lord's going to save his people, verses 1 to 14. I want you to watch for some things as we go through this. At the same time, that is in the latter days that were mentioned at verse 24, I will be the God of all the families of Israel. Now I want you to notice God's love. Uh, for the Lord appeared of old, I'm reading at verse 3, Yes, I loved you with an everlasting love and with loving kindness I have drawn you, and I will build you, and you shall be rebuilt, O virgin Israel. In other words, I never quit loving you. When I created this nation, when you sinned, I still loved you. When I sent you to captivity, I still loved you. And that's why I'm bringing you back out of captivity. And so are we tired of doom and destruction? All right, here's, here's love then. God said, I loved you. Even when you went, went astray, I still loved you. That's why I'm willing to bring you back out of captivity. So there's the love of God. Um, now, notice what God's going to do for them, verse 4. 
that you, I'm reading at the middle of verse 4, you shall again be adorned with your tambourines and go forth the dances of those who rejoice. You will again, and we're going to notice that concept in another phrase uh, later in the next chapter. I believe it's the next chapter. But I'm going to adorn you again. In other words, I'm going to take you and put you back in the condition you were before. In other words, I'm going to restore you. You can again be what you once were. And a stop and footnote or, or, or drive home a practical thing. I, I learned through all of this, these chapters, that God can make us again what we once were. So if we were once diligent and faithful and pure, but we've gone astray, whatever we've done, I don't care what it is, God said, I can bring you back and put you back the way you were. I can do that for you. And you might underline that because what a great promise that is. You shall again be adorned. You say, I don't feel adorned. I've, I've, I've done things. I've gone astray. I've, 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 I've sunk low. Okay. But you can again be adorned. With your tambourines. Well, the watchman is going to cry out, verse 6, uh, and say, Arise, let us go up to Zion to the Lord our God. What a great announcement that would be. You might underline it, verse 7, the word remnant. <coughs> Excuse me. And let me footnote here to say, there has always been, there always will be a remnant, a small portion left. God has always promised a remnant. And God's promising a remnant of his people that I'm not going to, utter, I'm not going to make a complete end of Israel. There's going to be a remnant that's going to come back. And that was what came back was a remnant. God has always promised, Daniel 2, 44, there always has been, there always will be a remnant. That doesn't mean there will always be a church at El Bethel. That doesn't mean there will always be a church in Shelbyville or Bedford County or Tennessee or in the U.S. Let's fast forward to the day of your great-great-grandchildren, and they may look around and say, I remember my great-great-grandparents talking about churches in Middle Tennessee, and there's not a single church in the whole state. That might happen, but there'll be a church somewhere. There's going to be God's people. There always has been. There always will be a remnant. Um, now, I want you to notice at, verse, at the end of verse 8, a woman with, uh, with child, I'm starting at the middle of verse 8, and uh, one that labors with child together, a great throng shall return there. In other words, a great number. I take that to be messianic as well. Is there a great number coming back out of the land into the, uh, into, uh, literal, to the literal return? Uh, in the post-exile period, yes. Uh, is that saying that under the Messiah there would be great numbers? In other words, people from all nations. That's the idea. Uh, and the answer is yes. Now God's going to take care of his people. Look at verse 9. I will cause them to walk by the wa rivers of, uh, of water and a straight way in which they will not stumble. And I am a father to Israel. In other words, I'm going to be like a father taking care of his children. I'm going to take them by the waters because they need that. I'm going to take them down the straight road so they don't stumble. I'm going to take care of my people. Here's a, a, a point of power, and I mean a point of care and of grace and of love. Now, at verse 10, God's going to do this with such power. Let, let me just paraphrase what it says, and then we'll go back and see if the verse doesn't say that. God's going to deliver them out of bondage with such power that the nations around are going to take note of that. The pagans will take note. God, look what God did for his people. Look at this. Hear, hear the word. Verse, verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the isles uh, afar off. He who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. The Lord has redeemed Jacob, uh, etc. And in other words, the nations are going to begin to, hey, look what their God did for them. Sent them off into captivity, but man, delivered them just like he said he, um, he would. Now, at um, verse, drop down to end of verse 12, part of the promise of them coming back is they will sorrow no more. They're going to sorrow no more. Their sorrow is over. That, that deep, uh, distressing grief they experience in Babylon is no more. Look at verse 13. Then shall the virgin rejoice uh, and dance. In other words, they're going to be filled with joy is the point of verse 14. So there's going to be great joy that comes. That, that's the point we're looking at here at verse 14. God's going to save his people and uh, there's going to be this great joy. We're going to see more about the joy in the next section. But I'll return their mourning to joy and, and will comfort them and make them rejoice rather than sorrow. In other words, I'm going to turn all the sorrow and to joy and celebration is what I'm going to do. And on that note, he shifts to another thought. So that's 1 to 14. God's going to save his people. 
Their sorrow is going to be turned to joy when Ephraim returns. Now this is focusing on the northern kingdom or the people from the northern kingdom. So let's see what's said in verses 13, uh, uh, yeah, verses uh, 15 rather through, uh, through verse 22. A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Uh, if you don't have a marginal note to this effect, if you have a Bible that doesn't have marginal references, you need to make you one. That's quoted in Matthew 2, 17 and 18 and applied to the Messiah. Was that ex exactly what, well, perhaps, again, this blending of the idea, a uh, blending, uh, uh, prophetic blend, as, as Humphreys calls it, is going on. But I think he's, he's, he's saying that the, the weeping is going to be turned to joy when they come back into the land. But he takes that principle and applies it to the day of the Messiah. Uh, Matthew 2, 17 um, and 18. And, and several people, I think Humphreys makes it, may make this point, and Harkrider makes it as well, that this passage well illustrates that concept of, of the prophetic blend uh, as, as well as any passage. Now, at verse 16... Uh, refrain from weeping for your eye and your eyes from tears. Uh, in other words, your, your sorrow is going to be turned to joy. Look at verse 17, you might underline. There is hope in your future. Is there hope in your future? Is there hope in your future? Do you have hope for the future? Not just the hope of eternal life, but that things will get better, that things can be better, that brighter days are ahead. God said, there is hope in your future. I think one of the problems was that Judah and Israel both had a limited focus. And, uh, and, and when captivity comes, they have a limited focus. We're going into captivity, and the prophet is trying to get them to see beyond the captivity to 70 years later, there is hope in your future. Interesting phrase. Now look at verse 18. I was, I've surely heard Ephraim... Uh, bemoaning himself and you have chastised me and I was chastised like an untrained bull restore me and I will return now verse 19 this is the design you're looking for this in your handout the design of captivity in other words what was the purpose of captivity here it is let's see it verse 19 surely after my turning I repented and after I was instructed I struck myself on the thigh I was ashamed yes even humiliated because I bore the reproach of my youth. What was the design of captivity? To make them ashamed and humiliated and to turn and to, to be instructed and then turn and repent. Does that make sense? That was the whole purpose of that. I'm sending you to captivity to learn. It was a chastisement. I wanted you to be humiliated. I, I wanted you to be ashamed of yourself. And then I wanted you to turn, learn from that and turn back to me and cry to me for deliverance. And I'll be here to, to deliver you. Now, uh, now, let's go on down to verse 22. Uh, How long will you get about, O backsliding daughter? For the Lord has created a new thing in the earth. In other words, a new relationship. Described here as a woman shall encompass a man. What is that about? I don't have a clue. <laughs> Uh, I do have a clue. I'm not sure. Uh, two or three ideas. Zur suggests that there's probably a reference to the virgin birth. I think probably not. But, okay, that's, uh, we, 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 I won't say he could be completely wrong about that. Pulpit suggests God's bride ra uh, rallies around her husband is the idea. I like what Umphreys, John Umphreys said in his work. He said it's the same word as... Uh, Surround found in Psalm 7 and verse 7. And it's the idea of the people of God being the woman uh, circled around the Lord for protection. Now that makes sense to me. Uh, that in this period of restoration, that a woman, that is the people of God, shall encompass or encircle or surround the man, that is, as, as a woman would uh, encompass the man. So the people of God are going to encompass uh, God. In other words, they encircle God for protection and turn to God for protection um, because they're, they're ashamed and they're coming back. 
And, and that seems, that, that makes sense to me. Now let's start at verse 25, uh, uh, verse 23 rather. Judah also is going to be returning and be established. Well, we've already seen they're coming together. So Judah is mentioned here. Uh, at verse 27, Judah is mentioned. Let's get the picture of their being restored. Verse 24, and they shall dwell in Judah itself and all the cities together, farmers and those that are going out with flocks. In other words, they're restored and going back to their life that, as it was before. Uh, now notice um, verse 25, I have saturated it, the, uh, the weary soul and I have replenished every sorrowful soul. Afterward, after this, I awoke and looked around with the sleep, uh, with my sleep, and my sleep was sweet to me. Look at that phrase, my sleep was sweet to me. Gives me the idea of, of comfort coming to Jeremiah when he understands, and thus ultimately to Jerusalem and to the people of God, when they understand the promise of the return. Uh, when, when there is something to, to it's, uh, sleep is sweet when you have something pleasant look to look forward to in the future versus something that's unpleasant in the future. Uh, your sweet, uh, sleep becomes sweet to you. That seems to be the point that's being made. Now start in verse 27 uh, uh, now, a new attitude's going to be found. And there's two things. There's one about God and then there's something about man. Let's see what the new attitude is, starting at verse 27. The, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Jacob with the seed of man and the seed of beast, and it shall come to pass that as I watch over them to pluck up and to break down and to throw down and to destroy and to afflict, I'll also watch over them to build and to plant, the Lord says. Do you see what he just said? He said, I'm going to deal with, I'm going to watch over Judah and Israel. And I've already been watching over them. I watched over them to tear down and to destroy. In other words, to punish them. I took them away and I put them in, in captivity. But I'm also going to be watching over them to rebuild and to, to, to plant and to bring up. So I'm just as much a God of grace as I am of severity. God is, there's the goodness and the severity of God, Romans 11 says. And we see that here. I punish when I need to, but I'm also blessing when I want to. My hand of mercy is still out there, God is saying. Here's the new attitude. In those days, verse 29, you're looking for this in your handout. Well, they will no more say, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. That's a proverb. What's the proverb say? It was a common proverb that blamed the fathers uh, for what they did. The fathers have eaten sour grapes and it caused the children's teeth to, to uh, sit on edge. In other words, uh, maybe uh, put it in a, another setting, the, 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 the fathers uh, drank, uh, drank something bitter and so that made our, our mouths turn bitter because what our fathers did. In other words, we're not responsible. <laughs> we're not responsible. It's our fathers. It's somebody else's fault. It's a blame game they're playing, pointing their blame at someone else. So verse 30 shows me that that's not true because everyone shall die for his own iniquity and every man uh, who eats sour grapes, his teeth are set on edge. Everybody bears responsibility for themselves. You eat the sour grapes, you're the one paying the price. And so ultimately in the, in the time of restoration, that is ultimately the Messiah, uh, that proverb is going to vanish. Now, 31 to 34 is quite simple because uh, we have that quoted in the New Testament. It's quoted in Hebrews 8, uh, 8 to 12, quoted in Hebrews 10 as well, a portion thereof, and it is applied to the day of the Messiah, that there is a new covenant uh, with the house of Israel and the house of Jacob. Is there a portion in the sense, is there a sense in which this is saying when I bring them back into the land that I'll have a covenant with them perhaps? But this is a new covenant, not like the old covenant. And so I'm not going to repeat everything we said on the Lord's day, but, but perhaps you may even want to make a note or two here. Hebrews chapter 8 serves as, and chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, serves as a divine commentary on this. That this is a better promise than the promise under the old covenant. And the ultimate promise is, I'll remember their sins and iniquities against them no more. That's the ultimate promise that's, that's so much greater. So this is a new covenant that's coming, God said. It's not like the old. Here's one of the differences. Uh, I know it's, it's, it's called a new covenant, so it means it's not like the old. It's not according to the covenant I made with their fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. So it's not like the one at, at Sinai. It's not like that one. 
And one of the things that's going to be different is, notice it in verse 34, no more shall every man say to his neighbor and every man to his brother know the Lord. We talked about this on the Lord's Day. I don't apologize for repeating, but it is a rep repeating of what we said. That under the Old Testament period, you were born into Israel and you're an Israelite and then you were taught to know the Lord. Where under the New Covenant, you can't be in Israel until first you were taught to know the Lord. That's the point of, of our verse, verse 34. Um, but ultimately, you might underline at the end, I will remember their sins and iniquities against them no more. That's one of the strong evidences that I know this section of consolation includes the day of the Messiah. Now let's go to the last section and before we go to um, chapter 32. And the last section is the seed of Israel will never cease and spiritual Jerusalem will never fall. What a promise. What a promise. Notice that he says, who gives sun and light by day and, um, and the ordinances of the moon and the stars and the light by night, who disturbs the sea? You say, what's that all about? What it's saying is, Israel will no more uh, uh, see the, the, uh, the ceasing of the sun and the moon. You might as well see the sun and the moon quit shining as for God's promise not to be fulfilled. That's his point. So, so get, get the point. Um, look at verse 36. If those ordinances depart from me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease uh, from being a nation. In other words, I, I promised, that this is the idea, the seed of Israel is never going to cease. There's going to be the, the perpetual going on of Israel. That ultimately has to have to do, do with the Messiah. It's not going to cease. It's not going to end. And it never will end. And you say, well, what kind of assurance? It's as much assurance as, as there is the sun and the moon. If, if, uh, if, if Israel ceases, you can count on the sun and the moon quitting shining because it's over. And so just as assured as there is the, the rising of the sun, in fact, it's impossible. Notice at verse 37, if the heaven above can be measured and the fountains of the earth uh, search beneath, I will also cast off the seed of Israel. If someone could take the stars and count all the stars and get the exact number of the stars or maybe the sand of the sea and you could do that, then I'll cast off Israel. You can't do it. It's impossible. And it's impossible for me to cast off Israel because I made a promise. And so God's promise is going to stand. Verse 40 has to have reference not to physical Israel, but to spiritual Israel. The whole valley of dead bodies and ashes and fields. Um, uh, What's well, not the phrase I'm looking for. Um, let me back up to verse 30. The days are coming, says the Lord, that the city shall be built for the Lord from the tower of Hananel to the uh, uh, corner gate. And the whole valley, now I'm at verse 40, of the dead bodies of ashes and also the fields as far as the brook to the corner of the horse gate, etc. Uh, it shall not be plucked down or thrown down anymore forever. Well, that is not true concerning physical Jerusalem and physical Israel. But it was true concerning spiritual. That has to be spiritual in application and must have reference to the Messiah. Now let's quickly get on to chapter 32. This is getting interesting, at least to me it does, that Jeremiah buys a field in 587. Now that date may not mean anything to you, but that's one year away from the fall of Jerusalem. There's already been two invasions. There's the third coming in 586. We're one year away, approximately. I don't mean exactly one year, but it's the year before 587. And so he buys property to assure that they're going to return. Let's start at verses 1 to 5. Jeremiah's in prison. Why is he in prison? You're looking for this in your handout. Well, verse, verse, uh, starting at verse uh, 3, he was in the court of the prison, verse 2. For Zedekiah the king had shut him up, saying, Why do you prophesy and say that the Lord says, Behold, I will give this city the hand of the king of Babylon, he shall take it. And you said, Zedekiah the king will not escape. Uh, from the hand of the, the Chaldeans. That's what you prophesied, and that's what you said, and that's why I shut you up. I made a marginal note to remind me of this principle. That didn't change the message, putting him in prison. And it didn't keep it from happening. <laughs> so it didn't change the message, didn't mean it's not true, nor did it keep it from happening. So somebody could, you could tell somebody about judgment to come, and they can can uh, slap you and they can beat you up or they can put you in prison or kill you, whatever. But that doesn't going to stop it. Still going to happen. Still going to happen. So, beginning at verse 6 now, uh, 
God told Jeremiah to that Hanamel, your cousin, it's your uncle's son coming, and he's going to offer you a field for you to redeem. And you need to buy it. And so verse 8, Hanamel, my, my uncle's son, came uh, to the court of the prison, etc., and said, please buy this field. And notice you might underline at the end of verse 8, then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. When things turn out to be just like God said, then you know it's the word of the Lord. He said, God said, Hannah Mill's going to come and have you to buy this field. Hannah Mill came and offered him the field. I knew then it was the word of the Lord. When it turned out to be just like God said, I knew that God was behind this. So I bought the field, he said. And assigned it as witness, etc. Now, let's drop down to verse 15. Uh, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. So why did he buy the field? It was a case of putting his money where his mouth is. Jeremiah's been prophesying, chapter 25 is a case in point. They're coming back in 70 years. Now, to give you a perspective, 70 years is a long time. 70 years ago would be 1952. Some of you were alive in 52, but many of us were not. 70 years was a long time ago. 1952 was a long time ago. Let's fast forward 70 years. That's the year uh, 2092. I don't think I'll be around 2092. That's a long time from now. And so do we really have confidence, I'm putting ourselves in the day of, of Jeremiah, that we are going to come back? Jeremiah says, yeah, we are. God said we are. I'm prophesying that we are. And so God's basically telling Jeremiah, put your money where your mouth is and show them you believe what you preach. My question is, would you have bought the field? Would you have bought the field? Would I have bought the field? Footnote here. Ezra put his money where his mouth is. Remember Ezra said, I I was ashamed to to ask for an escort. Uh, Ezra 8, I believe it is, verse 22. Um, I was ashamed to ask for an escort along the journey because I'd been telling people that God's going to be with us and protect us. So when it came time to go, yeah, it seemed dangerous, but I said God would protect us. So you know what? I didn't ask for an escort. I put my money where my mouth is. Do you put your money where your mouth is? Do you talk, uh, here's what I believe, here's where I stand, this is where my faith is. But then do we put our money there? Jeremiah said, okay, I will. Interesting, interesting. Now, beginning at verse 16, here's the prayer of Jeremiah. We won't t- take the time to go through all that because I'm, I'm, I'm not going to make chapter 33 if I don't. It's, it's full, 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 chuck full of expressions of praise. And so he basically praises God and then says, look, the siege mounds. A siege has already started. Nebuchadnezzar started, backed off because of Egypt fighting over here and he had to turn and give some attention to Egypt. And then he comes back and finally takes Jerusalem. But I want you to notice at verse 25, and you have said to me, O Lord, buy the field with money. In other words, I I take it Jeremiah is praying to God, the siege is is coming, and you're telling me to buy this field. But I bought it. I bought it anyway. Tells me it took strong faith for him to buy the field. Now the rest of the chapter is the answer of the Lord. And so what did the Lord say? Uh, is anything too hard for me? Verse 27. I mean, this, this seems like a big deal from Jeremiah's vantage point. You know, are we coming back? God said, this ain't no big deal for me. I can take you to captivity and bring you back. I can do what I want. I'm powerful. This city has been a provocation to me. Verse 31. And I wish we had time to notice more, but I want you to notice this. Um, Here's what they did. They turned their back to me and not their face. They didn't listen and receive instruction, verse 33. Yet, 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 yet. He said, they shall be my people and I'll be their God. And I'm going to instill fear in them. And fear, verse 40 40 tells me uh, that... I want them to have fear in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. And notice verse 42, just as I brought all of this great calamity, I'll also bring them back just as I promised. So, yes, Jeremiah, here's my answer to your prayer. 
It was their sin that carried them into captivity. But just as I took them into captivity, I'm bringing them back. You mark my word, it's going to happen. Now, our time is gone. I'm going to make a quick run through some things in chapter 33 and we're done. A description is given of the future of the branch of righteousness. And that obviously has reference to the Messiah. We call attention to a couple of references that have to do with the Messiah. Obviously, uh, about verse, uh, uh, the first 10 verses ha have to do with that, but verse 8 particularly. Uh, verse 15, the branch of right, has to do with the Messiah. Uh, I I've got to call attention um, to, to, uh, to expressions, same expression in two places. Verse 7, uh, I'm going to reveal the places as at the first. You might underline that. And look at it again at verse 11. At the end of verse 11, I'm going to return as at the first. There is a definition of restoration if I've ever seen it. You want to talk about restoration? It's taking something back as it was at first. You restore an old car, you don't just fix it up. You put it back like it was at first. Uh, you restore an antique, you put it back like it was at first. And so you restore a soul, you put it back like it was at first. God said, I'm going to put you back. Not different. I'm, just, I'm not going to pat you up. I'm going to put you back like you were at first. Interesting phrase to me. Um, but I want to comment at verse 16 about, uh, and this is the name by which she will be called. That kind of throws a curve to us. Talks about the branch of righteousness and the name by which she will be called. Wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What are we doing with that? I think there probably is a reference to the bride taking his name. We, we still live in a time when, we, when a couple marries, the woman takes the man's name. That, that probably is going to fade in time. I just bet you. But my parents were in the day, and some of you remember this, where the woman introduced herself. My mother never introduced herself as Mrs. Aurelia Rader. She had introduced herself as Mrs. Doris Rader. Any of you older heads remember that, where you went by your husband's full name? I'm Mrs. and you gave your husband's name. I think that's what this is talking about, that she's taking his name, and this is the name by which she, the people of God, will be called. Um, I think that, that makes more sense to me. Now, verse 17 has to be messianic, that David shall not lack a man sitting on the throne of the, of the house of Israel. That has to be messianic. You want to mark that as messianic? That has to be messianic. And with that, our time is gone, and we're going to have to stop. That's it. Consolation. Get into the personal section next time. Jeremiah gets personal, uh, and we'll talk about that next time.